Hello once again and welcome to another edition of the saskagtoday.com roundtable. We're joined by the Chief Agricultural Editor for saskagtoday.com, Kevin Hirsch, and 620 CKRM Regina Agri-News Director, Ryan Young. I'm your host, GX94 Yorkton Agriculture Director, Doug Falconer. And of course, we're into mid-October, we're already past Thanksgiving, and the crop reports are winding down. The last Saskatchewan crop report suggests 99% of the crop is in the bin, while the Manitoba crop report says 93% of the harvest is complete in that province. What's your take on those numbers, Kevin? I'm, yeah, I'm not surprised. It, it only came up a couple percent in Saskatchewan. I uh, drove out of Saskatoon probably four days ago, and I did see a couple of swathed canola fields that haven't been picked up yet, but practically, for all intents and purposes, pretty much done. And Manitoba will be a little bit uh, uh, behind because, one thing, they tend to get more precipitation. But the other thing is that, especially in eastern areas, they have a lot of corn and a lot of soybeans, which tend to be later maturing crops and, and takes a little bit more time to get off. But being a good run, as you drive around the countryside now, you'll see more sprayers going than you than you will combines as people try to get on uh, weed control as well as residual products for next year's crop. Is that what you've noticed too, Ryan? Yeah, it's a pretty similar site around Regina here. The fields are pretty empty. And I saw one producer actually by uh, Grand Coulee where I live. He was out with his tractor cleaning up the fields. So uh, we're seeing a little bit more post-harvest activity, obviously, uh, cleaning up the fields, harrowing, uh, some uh, post-harvest spraying, stuff like that, getting ready for next year. And kind of the hope at this point is uh, more moisture and more rain before it freezes up for the winter. So that's kind of the scene around Regina here. Doug, what's it like over in Yorkton? Well, I know the uh, latest crop report says we're 98% complete. Uh, most of the area that I've seen is done. Uh, like Kevin, I did made a quick trip from Yorkton to Saskatoon for Thanksgiving, uh, for a one-day kind of Thanksgiving thing. And I saw a field, uh, a swath field of canola that hadn't been combined yet. And it was actually probably closer to Saskatoon than it was to Yorkton. So yeah, there is still a little bit out there yet, but that was last weekend. So probably by this weekend, I would imagine most everything has been cleaned up. Of course, some other big news was the uh, Canada-India relations as Canada is accusing more uh, Indian diplomats of uh, causing issues and Canada expelled some of those diplomats and India responded by expelling some Canadian diplomats all uh, over concerns about uh, security and foreign interference, but uh, how is that going to impact pulse prices and all that sort of thing, Kevin? Well, we're they're a big uh, destination for our lentils and, and peas, uh, also do some uh, wheat business to, to India. And certainly Canada's name in India is Mud right now, or at least our prime minister's name is Mud in India. And I think it had people worried that there was going to be some instant retaliation and a, a few buyers were a little cautious in the marketplace and, and may have caused prices to back off marginally. But really, there's been nothing announced as far as an export tariff or, or any change in that regard. So for the most part, it's business as usual, uh, which is very similar to the situation with uh, China and canola. They, they announced an investigation uh, in, into uh, what they called canola dumping, which was a, a tit for tat, a diplomatic issue as well. Uh, and that caused some nervousness in the ranks, but nothing has been announced out of China either. So commodities tend to be coasting along, uh, maybe a little cautiously looking at those two jurisdictions, but so far no tangible uh, trade barriers. And Ryan, uh, we have news this week from the Canadian Grain Commission. Uh, they're, I guess, losing a bit of money, but they're just drawing from surpluses so that fees don't go up. Uh, I know you had a chance to do a story on that. Yeah, they're not increasing any fees over the next three years, and that follows a review of their fee structure that they do in every three years in that same kind of time frame. And uh, yeah, I spoke with uh, the commissioner of the Canadian Grain Commission, David Hunt, as to you know why that is and some of the other uh, factors going into that, as well as uh, maybe some uh, forecasts in terms of revenues and spending over the next little while. Uh, he said the factors leading to that decision, obviously uh, costs going up, just like everywhere else that we see 
when it comes to business, inflation going up, costs going up, that's certainly one thing. Another big factor is the lower than expected uh, grain export volumes. Now, a uh, primary source of revenue for the commission is inspecting outbound grain. And depending on the service that uh, they offer, the fees kind of vary generally. He didn't give me any specifics on numbers, but that funds about 90% of their operating budget. And then the remaining 10% is funded by the federal government. So um, just to keep the fees down, they're withdrawing uh, from an accumulated surplus that they have. And in fact, they've been doing that since 2021. So this isn't suddenly something new. This is something that they've been doing before. So uh, from what it kind of sounds like, the surplus is still going to be enough. Uh, by 2027, he projects that the surplus will be around $57 million. So even if they decide not to increase fees in the future, uh, they still have a little bit to kind of draw from to cover their operating costs. Kevin, what do you think of all this? Well, the Canadian Grain Commission came under a great deal of criticism a number of years ago when grain volumes were high and they'd set their fees too high and accumulated a very large surplus. And now they're, they're drawing that down. One thing that we have to keep in mind is uh, governments have always said they're going to modernize the Canadian Grain Commission. And one of the key points of contention is whether or not outward inspection should be mandatory. Right now, all ocean going vessels, it's mandatory that the Canadian Grain Commission inspects them. That's where they get the majority of their money from. But a lot of uh, importers say, we don't need a Canadian Grain Commission certificate. We want a private grain inspector. They, they cost less. We want that certificate. Well, so we're getting duplication of services. And uh, personally, they, they, not all farm groups agree with this. But personally, I, I think that, uh, yes, the Canadian Grain Commission should oversee it. But they, it shouldn't be mandatory. And it shouldn't be a mandatory expense that grain companies have to pay. And then they pass that expense back to farmers. But without that export outbound inspection fee, then the Canadian Grain Commission would indeed have a very large problem as to how to fund itself. So this is a continuing saga. All right, and of course, the Saskatchewan election campaign is into its home stretch. We're just a little over a week away from uh, Election Day, October 28th, and there was a debate on Wednesday night, and Kevin, you had a chance to watch it, and you suggested that agriculture was uh, a miss for the most part. Very little in that uh, uh, to deal with agriculture at all. You can look at each of the party's agriculture platforms uh, on their websites. One of the more interesting uh, and more detailed uh, requests from farm organizations, I just saw this uh, just in the last little while, but Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities, particularly their uh, acting president, Bill Huber, has put out a, a number of points on business risk management programs, particularly as it relates to the cattle sector that I think uh, should be part of both of the major parties' platforms. So I would encourage producers to, to take a look at that on the SARM website. And Ryan, now what's the sense of things in Regina? Of course, you work in Regina. What's going on there with the election just, uh, you know, not too far off? Well, the kind of the general sense is, uh, you know, it's kind of undecided, I guess, for the lack of a better term. Uh, you know, people, um, all depends on the issue that you're kind of looking at. Some people are for the SAS party. Some people are the NDP. Uh, traditionally speaking, the NDP, they usually have uh, better success when it comes to support from the cities as opposed to the rural areas where the SAS party dominates. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how it all kind of plays out here uh, in Regina. I kind of expect as well the NDP to gain a little bit more momentum compared to the last election. But uh, in terms of the rural areas, I think the SAS party uh, kind of has it in spades. All right. And of course, uh, some news came out Friday morning. Bruce Schapansky auctioneers out of the uh, Melford Tisdale area there. They've been sold to an American company. And uh, Ryan, you were on top of that. Yeah, Bruce Schapansky's auctioneers was acquired by uh, Steffes Auctioneers. They're a business based out of Fargo, North Dakota. And when I talked with uh, the owner, Bruce Schapansky, uh, he said that it was kind of good timing considering that he was uh, looking to get out of the business at, after uh, 36 years. And he really wanted to make sure, according to him, that uh, it went to a good company that 
uh, had a passion, the same passion as he has for the auction business and came across uh, Steffes Auctioneers and they were actually looking to expand into Canada anyway. So that was uh, kind of good timing for both companies as well. Obviously, uh, Steffes has locations kind of around the Midwest and the Rocky Mountain region of the United States. And uh, with this acquisition, they're now into Saskatchewan and in Tisdale specifically. So um, from what I heard from Bruce as well, not a whole lot of changes in terms of how they do business or uh, employee structure or anything like that. Everything will stay the same and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Kevin, of course, there's always concerns. He, I know my dad was always one of those guys that was concerned when he heard that an American company was buying a Canadian company in Saskatchewan or something like that. Is there any reason to be concerned over something like this? It's it's a very competitive business, and there's many other players in that market. All of them are a, a bit regional. Japansky tends to operate in, in northeast Saskatchewan, in southwest Saskatchewan, where I sit. Uh, Switzer Auction does some business. I think around Regina, you, you hear McDougal Auction a lot. But I think the big player out there and an international player now is uh, Ritchie Brothers. And uh, I just uh, I participated in a Ritchie Brothers sale. I was outbid on almost everything. Uh, this, <laughs> and one thing I will say, I wish we could get back to in-person auctions. Uh, but all of the auction companies have gone to online. I think it suits them very well. I think it probably uh, commands a lot of uh, maybe even extra dollars from that. But by the same token, I, I sure miss the uh, being able to gather around an auction sale with uh, with neighbors and, and do a lot of visiting and and uh, catch up on a whole bunch of agronomic things as well. So I, I don't think it'll be a concern having an American company taking over Bruce Schapansky, but there is lots of competition in the marketplace. It'll be interesting to see whether under a new ownership, they actually expand uh, their, their offerings in Saskatchewan and are, are more competitive. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the SaskAgToday.com Roundtable. On behalf of 620 CKRM Regina Agri-News Director Ryan Young and the Chief Agricultural Editor for SaskAgToday.com Kevin Hirsch, I'm GX94 Yorkton Agriculture Director Doug Falconer saying so long until next time.